they say I'm working, we'll see. All right, so getting back to it, um, human services practice, right? So a lot of things we can look into research with that, you know, what kind of services can we provide? What if we're in a rural community right now? Let's say instead of being Las Vegas, Nevada, we're in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Has anyone ever been there? Anyone ever been to Las Vegas, New Mexico? What do you think it, how do you think it compares to Las Vegas, Nevada? It doesn't, right? Do you think it's a little smaller? I mean, I th I, I'm pretty confident it's gonna be a lot smaller than here, right? Mexico-ish, right? I was just curious, the population as of 2018 was 13,107. A little different than Las Vegas. Let's see what our population currently is. Our current population in Las Vegas is 644,000 people. So what if we were looking at where to put hospitals? Where would you probably rather put hospitals in Las Vegas, New Mexico or Las Vegas, Nevada? I'm hoping that's an obvious answer, right? Las Vegas, Nevada is gonna need more hospitals than Las Vegas, New Mexico. Does that mean that Las Vegas, New Mexico needs no hospitals? No, right? They still need healthcare there, right? So how do we know, what kind of research does the federal government do in order to determine where to put the best research or the best, where to put the money that comes out of the government? Kind of, re what determines that? So what determines population, right? The census, exactly, Jenna. That's why it's so important to actually, I'm gonna preach on that. You need to do your census because the census itself is gonna drive, you know, the money coming to your area. The more people that respond, the more money that can come to that area because they know there's a dedicated group of people. That's why a lot of times we'll say estimated population because not everyone responds to the census because they think it's a form of government control, right? but we need it in order to drive, you know, funds for schooling, right? It's kind of, help, kind of helps us decide if we need a new elementary school in certain areas, right? When I came up in my schooling back in the town that I'm from, which is called Dillsburg, and yes, we drop a dill pickle on New Year's Eve, that's how redneck we are. Um, when I came through, my graduating high school class before, so the amount of kids that started with my class was 100. We graduated 58. Right, so just about 50% of the people didn't graduate, but we graduated 58. My brother's class, my younger brother, who was, he's what, two years younger than me, his graduating class was 500. It's a big difference, right? Exactly, we had to change the whole area. We had to go from one elementary school to three, because we didn't have enough space. I graduated in 1958, pretty close, um, right? So we had to, the census helped us determine that. We have to decide what do we need. In this area, <clears throat> that's okay, you're, it's not, you're not far off. Um, in this, well, you gotta understand, I also come from redneck area, so most people don't graduate. Um, in this area, it helps drive funding, right? If we need more social funding in certain areas, it helps you know, research with minorities. It also helps finding out that you know, minorities are underserved community. They really are. It also shows that minorities are underrepresented in research too, right? If everyone that does research looks exactly like me, the research is gonna tend to trend towards researching stuff for people of my ethnicity. That's just inherent bias, right? We know that, you know, it's just, you know, if, if the research is done by an entire, if all research is done by an entirely Asian population, the research is going to come out different than if it's done by a Caucasian or African American, right? It's just a little different in the way that we do things. So minorities are underrepresented. They really are. Um, what are limitations? Time. Research takes time. Are we kind of crunched on time right now with COVID? Yeah, right? This is why everyone's like, we got to reopen the government. We got to reopen the country. We got to open the country. We got to open the country. 
but we don't have the research to open the country. We don't know if it's safe. They just released a study today that shows that there's a good chance your antibody resistance to COVID is less than four weeks. Think about that for a second. Right? So they're already looking at that maybe the antibody resistance, once you develop COVID and you get resistant to it, it might only last a month. Now, there's other research showing it, it's not like chickenpox exactly, right? There's other research that shows it might be three months. But let me ask you guys here. Let's say one of you went through COVID and you are told you're perfectly fine, right? You, you went through it, you're good, go back to work. Are you willing to take that gamble? that your, your immunity might not last, right? So literally we could go back to work now if even at the, on the good side, they're saying six months. So, you know, it's, it's what, April now, right? Oh God, I just realized it's 420. It's April now, um, six months from now, so October. Oh, it's 420 all month, isn't it really? But I'm just saying, um, October, your immunity runs out. What do you think is going to happen again in October? For those that don't know what 420 is, look it up. Exactly, Mike. I, it's, Google is your friend. What happens, what happens if in October, all of a sudden, your immunity runs out? Are you willing to take that gamble? Yeah, increase it. We're going to have another peak, right? This is what we're worried about. And I don't know if you guys have seen Japan, but what's happening in Japan right now? I know a lot of you are avoiding the news like the plague, but I unfortunately can Yeah, they're having a huge spike. That's what we're worried about. We're worried that, you know, we're going to get there again and, you know, more people are going to die. And then we're going to have to go back. Into, so here's the deal. If we release social distancing too early, there's a good chance we are going to have to do another social distance where we are like this again, but for even longer. Right? There are some, you know, like Los Angeles, the mayor of Los Angeles just said, there are gonna be no sporting events till 2021. Think about that for a second. No sporting events till at best 2021. That's a lot of revenue, right? Actually, exactly. I'm getting tired of watching NASCAR drivers drive virtual races. Yeah, most schools in Kelly as well, right? Uh, Denver just, the mayor in Denver said that there's a good chance that most schools will not go back in fall, that they have to be prepared to teach online until 2021. I don't know what's going to happen with us. Uh, the casinos are really pushing for us to open up here. But, you know, it's just, I mean, think about that for a second. You know, my heart just broke about two days ago. Because guess what they announced is canceled in California coming up in June. Does anyone see? It was really since like a, hopefully. Yes, Comic Con just got canceled. <laughs> oh my God. My heart. This is the first time I've got full time passes. Not yeah, I know. But that's okay. It's gonna they rescheduled it. I saw it. I'm, I'm all I'm all for not fest Japan. Actually, I'm actually I'm actually looking at it, going, hmm, that could be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, Comic Con got canceled. Oh my god, right? Comic Con got canceled. That is saying that even the nerds at this point are saying this is bad, right? It's true though, right? And and honestly, let's be honest about that. I was surprised it took them that long. I feared that we would be the first ones to say cancel it. Well, and that's the thing, actually, we have to look at that. That's actually a real, that's one of the things we are actually having a meeting on tomorrow. We're going to have to look at some way that maybe what's, let's say that you, you, you come in contact with COVID, you're going to have to self-isolate, right? We have to come up with a way that you can continue your schooling. So we're going to probably have to do video teaching the whole time. Even if we're on, on campus, we're probably going to still have to Zoom. Exactly. Yeah, I can imagine, Mike. That's actually horrible. I, just, just resist the urge and don't die, please. We, we really like you. We don't want you dying. Um, but yeah, so we're going to look at, actually, that's a great question because, I mean, we're looking at going, if, you know, something happens like this, we may have to do Zoom on top of regular classes. So we have to be prepared for that, right? And not only that, but I hate to say it, but 
let's face it, not all instructors are cut out for this. Right? Not all instructors are cut out to teach this way. So we have to think of how we can do this. Right, exactly, there we go. Right, Melissa, that's exactly right. And same with me, right? I put you guys at risk, wouldn't I? So, you know, we may have to do it where you guys are in the classroom and I have a lab assistant and I'm teaching remotely. So that's the thing we have to, th we have to look at this. This is kind of a terrifying thing. Um, financial considerations. Right now, is there a financial consideration for all the research we're doing on COVID? Oh yeah. That first company that comes up with that miracle drug. Oh yeah, as Cyborg would say, right? They're definitely gonna make some cash, right? The first, the first one that comes up with a valid test is gonna make a ton of money, right? So we have to be thinking about that. That's why there is some financial concerns. Are there financial concerns? Another epi, you're exactly right, Jenna, could be, right? But also, you know, when you see, and I'm gonna, oh, I gotta am recording, but oh well. I'm gonna say this, when you see somebody pushing a medication, such as hydroxychloroquine. What do you think the big reason they might be pushing that medicine is? Mm -hmm. I mean, it couldn't be that the people pushing hydroxychloroquine have a financial vested interest in that medicine, could they? No, 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 that would never happen, right? It never happens with doctors either. Right? I mean, never did, you know, Purdue Pharmaceutical give doctors lots of money to promote pain meds. It's an honest profession. Exactly, Alex. No one ever lies. Um, anticipating avoiding problems. So not only we have to look here, and I love that we're doing this COVID because this makes this lecture so easy. Not only COVID do we have to look at the current state of COVID, but what are we also going to have to prepare for? Yeah, what about COVID 2020? or COVID 2022, right? We have to be preparing to avoid those things in the future, right? We did some great things with swine flu and with um, avian flu, right? Because now we've got some vaccines against it and it doesn't protect us completely, but it definitely mitigates the effect of those flus. Equipment limitations. Let's say that we wanted to do a study on COVID. Could we do an effective study at PMO on COVID? No, we don't have the equipment, right? We might have a centrifuge, I think, over in med tech or med assisting, but I bet we don't have electron microscopes. I don't know that we have gram stain, straining or staining. I don't think we have the resources. So the equipment limitation is big. What about UNLV? Do they have the, re the resources? Yeah, well, maybe, right? Combine, that's why UNLV is working really hard with UNR at this point, because they both combine the resources and now they are able to research the stuff. Out of the box thinking. Has out of the box thinking ever affected the medical profession? Yeah, it does, right? Who'd have thought that a fungus could be antibacterial? Right? No one, penicillin is just mold. But we found out that by, you know, out-of-box thinking, what happens if we use penicillin on a bacterial infection? And we found out it makes it stronger and then we can't treat it. I mean, no, it does help it. Uh, in the box thinking as well, we, we have to have those people that are the dreamers and the realists, right? I don't know where I fall on that. Exactly. Yeah, it's the same thing, Jenna. I agree. I, I became allergic just from taking it so much because when I grew up, that was all they gave us. Um, but in the box thinking, right? We need dreamers and realists. We need people that are looking at different ways to change things, but also ways that we can use what we got. I don't know where I fall on that. I'd like to think that I'm a dreamer, but I think I'm more of the realist. Yeah, realistic dreamer, exactly. I want things to get better, but I don't know that I think out of the box a lot. I think out of the box with kids a lot though. When I'm treating kids, I'm always doing something a little different. I'm really mad about, there's a thing called an upsies I'll talk about when we get in peds that helps kids walk. I've been doing that for years. Someone, you kind of have to, exactly, Mike. Someone took, it wasn't my idea, but took an idea like mine and developed this harness that ped, or peds therapists can wear and made a million dollars on it. I'm like, gosh darn it, I've been doing that since like the 90s. 
I should have marketed it. Uh, how do we select the appropriate uh, methodology? Well, we have to look at what the nature of the problem is, right? Is the problem subjective or objective? Right? If we have a subjective problem, is it going to be harder to research? Like, let me give you a subjective problem. The Patriots are the worst football team in the world. Well, they might be next season, but that's beside the point. Um, right? That's a subjective problem. It's going to be really hard to prove that. And even if I were to prove that they are, the worst team in the world. That could be my subjective opinion. Somebody else may say they're the best team in the world. Hey, ATL's got some good uniforms going on right now. I'm just going to say. Um, four types of research, quantitative, qualitative, mixed, and criterion, right? So how do we draw, and we're going to talk about those in a little bit. How do you draw conclusions? Well, we, when we're looking at that, we can present graphs. Why do you think we use graphs a lot in research? Pictures are easy, exactly, right? Um, it looks pretty too, you're exactly right. So we are a visual oriented species. When we see graphs, we tend to look at those, right? We don't tend to look at the block of text. So it looks pretty and it draws us to it. Uh, sharing data among colleagues and receiving constructive feedback is another way, right? So we have to be open in statistical analysis and then analyzing the data and results. We have to be open that our results are wrong, right? I love it when, they, uh, when an anti-vaxxer says that a research on vaccines is not a proven fact, right? Facts are universally agreed to items based upon research, but we also are under the understanding that we have to be open to the fact that something may change in the future. So they say that's why all vaccines don't work. Yeah, that, that's, part, that's probably why I don't wanna do research either, Russell. I mean, it's not like I've got a big ego or anything, right? I'm never wrong, right? Even my coffee cup says it, but I'm not wrong. It's a perfect coffee cup for me. So here's kind of that EBM triad, right? Evidence-based medicine. So patient values and expectations. Do we have to take those into account? Absolutely. Best external evidence and our clinical expertise. So there has to be this blend of all three of those, right? So we have to have this perfect Venn diagram, right? That in the middle is where we want to fall. Where's my little mouse? There it is. My mouse went away. So we want to fall right in here. Which way do we tend to trend in physical therapy, though? What do you think? I think, yeah, I think we kind of fall somewhere over here right? Maybe about right there. We want the patient's values and expectations, but I think a lot of times we rely too much on our individual clinical expertise and are not willing to look at this research. I've run into PTs like that, that, you know, they do spray and stretch for every patient. We are customer service, you're right. They do spray and stretch for every patient, even though a lot of the studies have shown that spray and stretch is not really useful, but they've done it for years, so they're going to keep doing it. Right? Or the patients really like it. The patients love when I give them a massage every day. Well, that massage may not be useful at this point. Right? So we have to kind of work along those whole ideas. So we need to identify information and develop focused searchable clinical question, conduct searches, critically appraise the idea, integrate the appraised research, and evaluate the effectiveness and efficacy. So this is kind of the process of that EBP. Right? This is how we go about doing research in the healthcare world. We have to look at it. We have to be able to evaluate the effectiveness. We have to prove, especially nowadays with healthcare, that what we do works and we are deserving of our piece of the pie. Right? So let's look at this one here. This is a great study. Has anyone ever seen this study before? Anyone ever seen it? I'm just curious. This is a great study. Parachute used to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenges, systemic re systematic review of randomized control trials. So what is that literally trying to figure out? If parachutes are effective, right? Exactly. I love the randomized control trials. 
So here, determine whether parachutes are effective in preventing major trauma related to gravitational challenge. So they're going to do a systemic, systematic review of randomized control trials. So what's a systematic review? Are those really high-end research studies? What do you think? Do you remember that from talking last semester? Are systematic reviews really high-end or in from law and ethics way back when? Who gets to see by parachute exactly? So systematic reviews, or we go back and look at all the evidence that's out there, and it's a really good study. They did a systematic review of autism and vaccines and proved that vaccines don't cause autism, right? So this is a really high-level study. So now we're going to go back and we're going to look at Medline, Web of Science, Embase, Cochrane Library databases, all inappropriate internet sites and citation lists. We're going to look at studies showing the effects of using a parachute during free fall. Major outcome will be death or major trauma is defined on the injury severity score of greater than 15. So we have this set test that's going to show us how bad the severity of their injury is going to do. This is ironic. When they did this study, they were unable to identify any randomized control trials of parachute intervention. So no one has ever done a randomized control trial of seeing if parachutes work. I wonder why that is. Does anyone have an idea? Is this research we needed to do? Let's put it that way. No, right? Control would have the jump without a parachute, exactly, right? Who's going to sign up for that test? Just imagine me telling you, so you're going to jump out of a plane. You're going to be assigned to one of two groups. The first group is going to have a parachute. And the second group, you're going to pull on your string, and instead, a rubber ducky is going to pop out. Right? And I would definitely use a rubber ducky. And it has to be double blind, exactly. So the researchers can't know who's getting it, neither can the people. Yeah, that's going to work. No one's going to sign up for that test. Right? So with many interventions, this is great, with many interventions intended to prevent health, the effectiveness of parachutes has not been subjugated are subjected to rigorous evaluation by using randomized control trials. Advocates of evidence-based medicine have criticized the adoption of interventions evaluated by only using observational data. We think everyone might benefit if the most radical protagonists of evidence-based medicine organized and participated in a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial of the parachute. Ironically enough, this was legitimate research, guys. They did this as kind of a gag, right? So literally what they're saying here is that we don't have evidence-based information on this. We just have anecdotal evidence that parachutes work because people have jumped out of a plane and they've survived, right? What's already known about this topic? Parachutes are widely used to prevent death and major injury. Parachute use is associated with adverse effects due to failure of the intervention and iatrogenic injury. And studies of free fall do not show 100% mortality. This is true, right? If you jump out of a plane, you might not die. Somebody had to try the first parachute, right? Guess where that came from, too? That didn't come from the civilian world. Yeah, it came from war and military. You're exactly right. No randomized control trials parachute use have been undertaken. The basis for parachute use is purely observational. And apparently, efficacy would potentially be explained by a healthy cohort effect. So what if all the people that jumped out with parachutes would have survived anyway? Think about that for a second. Did we just waste the money on those parachutes? Individuals who insist that all interventions need to be validated by randomized control trial need to come down to earth with a bump. Yeah, I would say with a log on their head. Right? Um, and they always say that jumping out of a plane, it's not the fall that kills you. It's a sudden stop at the end. I, I counter that. I, there was times that I felt like I was dying. Um, so this is literally saying that not all research has to be done. We know this. Right? Here is an ironic thing, ironic research, and we'll talk about the next one after this. But how about this? Seatbelt use saves lives. Did we have to research that? We had to research, and it used to kill people. Yeah, exactly right. But Nowadays, we know that seatbelts do save lives. We had to actually research it and prove that cars needed seatbelts. 
Think about that for a second. We had to prove that cars needed seatbelts. Whatever. I'm just not even going to go any further on that. That just blows my mind. So let's look at this one. When is ice cream sales rise due to homicides? Coincidence or will your cone murder you? Has anyone seen this study before? This is a great study. I love this one. Correlation between homicide and ice cream sales. When ice cream sales increase, the rate of homicide increases. So it's been a long topic of statistics. So when ice cream sales go up, homicides go up. So ice cream sales cause homicides. It's been clearly demonstrated and duplicated in every United States city research through systematic reviews that ice cream sales skyrocket, homicide rates also skyrocket. Right? And it could be, could there be any other reason why this occurs? Of course, of course. Strawberry shortcake to be exact, right? The stupid strawberry shortcake uh, crunchies, right? From the ice cream vendor, he probably puts something in it and makes everybody go crazy and kill people. So how does this study demonstrate research fallacy? Because it doesn't take into account anything else that could cause this, right? I could just as well do a study that shows that during months that have you wearing winter clothing, homicide rates go down. So therefore, our winter clothing reduces homicides. Right? In some areas, that's big, right? A lot of times, winter clothing would definitely reduce it because no one's going outside, right? If it's minus 50 degrees out, you ain't likely to go out. But yeah, anything can be correlated to another, right? It, it could be, right? So how could we further tighten the study to show ice cream causes murder? Well, we'd have to look at how many people are murdered with an ice cream cone? That would be an interesting study, um, right? So this things, we have to, this common sense research, we may not need, right? But somebody's gonna study this, right? It's like my woodchuck question. You guys all love the woodchuck question, right? The woodchuck question frustrated a lot of you. But somebody got paid to research how many chucks a woodchuck could chuck, if a woodchuck could chuck wood, because somebody wanted it. Who's funding this crap? IRBs. Right. Saying warm weather causes crime is just as simplistic as saying ice cream causes crime. Correlation between temperature and violent crimes is worth remembering the next time that a snow showboating police chief holds up a press conference in March and brags he solved the city's murder problem. Right? I love this. And my personal thing is that in cities that have strict gun laws, murders are still happening. Therefore, gun laws don't help with murders. Anyone ever heard that one before? It's similar to the COVID thing right now, right? Similar to the COVID thing right now. They're saying, I, and I just heard it from one of the major senators, um, Kennedy, I think he's out of Louisiana, said that let's look at deaths. Even though we're social distancing, people are still dying. So why are we social distancing? It's not helping. We should just go back to work and everyone go back to work and you know, people are gonna die anyway. He's not wrong that people are gonna die anyway, right? He's not, people are still gonna die from COVID. But are we at a less likelihood of the whole population dying if we stay socially distant? Absolutely. Right? Correlation does not equal causation. That's the big thing you hear in research. Just because things look alike and they look like they match up, until we research that, we can't prove those things match up. Right? We can't, you know, if I say that, you know, what if I said lasers to the eye cause blindness? Do you think there'd be somebody out there that would argue, no, uh, -uh. lasers don't cause blindness? So let's put a laser in everyone. How many lasers and what do we do with the sharks, right? But there's somebody out there that's gonna say that it doesn't, right? How about this one? Shooting a green laser beam at pilots as they're taking off and landing is not a bad thing. So it shouldn't be outlawed because you can't hurt the pilots, right? Yeah, Ashley has a vested interest in this one, All right? So we've got to, this stuff is just silly. Some of the stuff we just have to go, this is just common sense, right? In the military, there was actually for a while during the uh, Gulf War, a discussion whether because there are armor piercing bullets, 
whether soldiers needed Kevlar vests. Well, if there's armor piercing bullets, then they don't need Kevlar vests, obviously. Think about that for a second. Some, you know, senator said, well, you know, there are bullets out there that are greater than the Kevlar vest, so let's just stop giving our soldiers Kevlar because it's expensive. It just blows my mind that we have these kind of discussions like that, right? I don't understand it. So what would happen if we never had any research? We'd never know if our treatments are the best treatments. We'd have no credibility, no reimbursement, and difficult to build on current knowledge, right? In healthcare right now, especially in the physical therapy world, we are going to have to demonstrate that our patients get better. If our patients don't get better, what's going to happen to our reimbursement rates soon? Yeah, it's going to decrease even further, right? So we have to prove that what we're doing, reimbursement is soon going to be tied to results. Does anyone have a problem with re your reimbursement being tied to your results? What do you think? Do you think there's a huge pushback to the physical therapy community about this? Yeah, there is, right? Because people are saying, well, I don't understand. I've always had good results. I shouldn't have to prove it. I shouldn't have to prove that my treatments work. Well, if you honestly, if you don't want to prove that your treatments work, that's fine. Why should you get reimbursed on the same patient clients does suck. We have to get better at that. I'll honestly admit to that, Jenny, you're right. Um, but how much of that, how much, and let's, let's be hundred percent honest here, Jenna, how much of that patient compliance is because we're not giving them the one-on-one -on -one care they deserve. It's not going to get better. Right, be true. But telehealth may even, we don't know. Tele, we may prove that telehealth works because we're giving them more one on one treatments. If I'm doing telehealth, it's not like I can do 20 people. <laughs> I have 20 cameras set up around me. Okay, let's do therapy. Doesn't work that way. Right? Have them all join the Zoom room. It's fantastic. Right. So we have to kind of look at this. Research is important in our clinical practice. Stop doing things just because of what we've always done and start doing things because the evidence backs it up, right? This is the big argument with techs. I'm gonna be honest. When we started bringing up the tech laws, all of a sudden, all the clinicians that never go to meetings showed up to meetings. It was amazing. I haven't seen Matt Smith for years. And we started bringing up changing tech laws and all of a sudden Matt shows up, right? And there were a lot of other, I'm not just singling him out, I like Matt. It's funny, it's a really good guy. But all those clinicians that have never shown up to any of the meetings suddenly showed up. And they're saying, well, we've been doing this for years, so why should we change? It's working. No, it's not working. Same to company meetings, exactly, right? Until things are changing, we don't see people. But when things start changing, they come with their verdant, you know, hardcore oppositions. And change is hard, right? I don't know if any of you have ever quit smoking, but that change is hard, right? That's really rough change. It hurts. But if we don't change and evolve, we're going to be phased out of healthcare. We just are, right? Why should they come to us and not go to a chiropractor? Chiropractors show they get great results because they get compliance on patients. I went to, I went to a PMM person. Prove it. Um, yeah, it hurts too. Yeah, this lesson hurts for some of you. But think about that for a second. Why, why do chiropractors show such great results? How do they do it? How do they get customers to respond to their surveys? Yeah, one-on-one -on -one and brainwashing. Placebo effect a little bit, right? But I, I love to look at their, I love to look at their business model because they get audible results. And not only that, but they get results in surveys. We can't get half of our people to fill out a, a follow-up survey. But man, when I, was looking, when I was looking for this lesson, most chiropractors get 75% of all exit surveys returned to them. 75%. Yeah, right? 
What are they doing right that we're doing wrong? I'd love to know. I mean, brainwashing is part of it. Um, but they're just real, they're, they're good salespeople. They are, it's a, and you know, I'm not gonna, they're only certain chiropractors. There are good chiropractors out there, right? There are good chiropractors out there. And there are chiropractors that employ PTs and PTAs because they know they can't do it alone. So I'm gonna say there are good chiropractors out there. Um, uh, what's Jim's last name? I can't remember, the guy from Toro. He's a really brilliant chiropractor. He's a PT and a chiropractor. Exactly, right? Right, Mike? How hard is it to fill out one survey? But they get everything filled out. Blows my mind. They get people to sign up for a year's contract. We're just not that great at this. So here's the ICF, right? This is kind of looking at those things. You do need to know these for your boards. You need to understand what the difference between a participation restriction and a body structure and function problem. So you have to be aware of this. So I'm not going to go through this again. We beat this horse to this dead. So where do we get sources of knowledge? Personal experience, right? This can be a problem in clinical science. It's also a problem with doctors, right? This is why we ended up in this really, really super bug thing because doctors said, well, you know, penicillin works, so we'll give everyone penicillin. So reliance on a precedent as reason for making clinical choices generally stifles the research for new information and may perpetuate an idea when contrary evidence is available. It's true, right? Do you know how hard it is convincing a doctor that a CPM doesn't work? Do you know how hard it is? Do you know the pushback you get when you tell a doctor CPM is useless? Why do you think they don't wanna give up the CPMs? Well, because it's what they've done all their life. Why do you think doctors still do posterior hip replacements? Right, old habits die hard, they do, they truly do. Right? You guys are starting a new habit here going to school. That's really rough. This is even a new habit for you. It's hard to get out of the, the habit of going to school and coming here and you guys are changes. Now, once we go back to on-campus grounds, it's going to be hard for you guys to go to on-campus again because we've developed new habit. Exactly. So this is all stuff we have to kind of look at, right? Authority, placing trust in others. Have you ever seen a PT that dominates what goes on in his clinic or her clinic? Right, and I don't want to. I don't want to call them tyrannical, but they're say that it's my way or the highway. You will do what I tell you to do, or else. Right. You do have to have this authority when scientific evidence is not possible, but we jeopardize professional responsibility when we do not critically appraise authority. Seen one try exactly. Right. Right now, the people that are, and I'm going to use this, again, the situation is perfect. The people that are following blindly what the president and what Fox News says, and I'm not really on CNN being biased. Please don't ever think that. CNN is biased as much as Fox News is. They just tend to spew less bias. Um, you know, that's why I tend to watch BBC and channels like that, because or NPR as well. Um, but, right, these are why these people are going to the Capitol buildings and protesting because they're hearing that this is fake. This is no better than the cold, right? This is no worse than the cold. This is no worse than the flu. Everyone will be able to live through this. And there are some serious problems with COVID that show that even if you survive it, the respiratory complications from it may last five to 10 years afterwards. Uh, most of the studies that are coming out right now show that people are having about 25% reduced lung function after having COVID. That's not good. Right, 25% reduced lung function puts you at risk of getting other problems. Trial and error, when we have no other basis for making a reasonable decision, right? This is what we're talking about right now. What do you have to lose? That's trial and error, right? The old college trial, right? So let's say I, you know, the plane's going down and I walk up to you and go, well, you know, you either can take a parachute or you cannot take a parachute. What do you have to lose from jumping out of the plane? Right? So uh, trial and error is not necessarily the best decision. Logical reasoning, deductive and inductive reasoning, taking specifics from major generalization and making generalization from specific observations. Inductive reasoning led to developing the scientific method, right? It led to us going, I wonder how this happens. Occam's razor. This is a big one in healthcare, right? The simplest explanation is probably best. This is the house thing that it's lupus, right? Why did he constantly suggest things were lupus? Does anyone know?
Well, because most of the stuff that you deal with in differential diagnosis looks like lupus. So if it looks like lupus, it smells like lupus, and it acts like lupus, it's probably lupus, right? If you're in the field here in the US and you hear hoof beats coming at you, what should you be thinking? Obviously, Justin. It's gonna be running, just, running Justins, right? Here in the United States, you'd think horses, right? Or maybe where I'm from, you may think deer, because there are stampedes of deer as well. Um, but what if you're in Africa? Could that change? If you suddenly hear the beating of hooves, could Africa be different? Yeah, right? Or what if you hear the same thing and you're in India? Still, Justin. In India, it could be different, right? You may hear the sound of hooves beating and it's not hooves, it's elephants. So here in the United States, we think horses. That's just kind of the way we are, right? This is why a lot of patients that have, if you remember correctly, when I talked about, um, you know, right now, if, let's say you have, have a patient that their blood pressure spiking, right? And they're starting to sweat, they're starting to become diaphoretic. We should think autonomic dysreflexia just because it's probably the simplest explanation. It may not always be the right explanation, but nine times out of 10, if you think that the patient's gonna survive, whereas if you do the opposite of for autonomic dysreflexia, they may not. So Occam's razor is just the simplest explanation is probably the best. So sources of knowledge, two assumptions. Nature is orderly and regular. We know that's not true, right? And events or conditions are not random or accidental. This is the thing we have to, we look at with the scientific method. Nature is orderly in some ways, but does chaos still come into play? We trend towards disorder, right? We trend towards entropy. And even that, I mean, look at the way we are right now, right? Your house right now probably looks beautiful for most of you because you've had plenty of time to clean it and do stuff because you're getting bored, right? We go back to work, we're going to trend back towards disorder. That's just the way it is, right? So challenge the status quo is important for, stat for scientific research. Be creative, share and publicly accessible, right? We have this problem right now where we're arguing that China's not giving us all, our re all the research. Why do you think China would have a vested interest not to give us all the research? Competition, right? They wanna come up with the drug first. It's true, they do. And war too, yeah, there's some of that too. You know, I don't, when I grew up, we had the Cold War. I'd say we have the information war now, right? Because information is power nowadays. Uh, system, systematic, we have to make sure that our findings are replic re yeah, re replicable. They can be repeated, there we go. They're objective, it controls for errors and bias, and limited generalization of knowledgeable claims. We have to make sure that we're doing all of that when we're doing this research. And this difference between looking at cause and effect finding relationships and describing populations. So we're gonna look at the different things as we go down through here. So quantitative knowledge is single reality, emphasizes numbers, measurements, deductive, inductive reasoning, controls and experience, and qualitative talks about multiple realities. Which one of those do we live in on a daily basis? Do we live in a quantitative world or a qualitative world? What do you think? Do we, let me ask this, which way we trend? We, we trend towards more qualitative, right? We care more about what's going on and everything going, the more subjective information. We do live in a quantitative world though, right? Money is still money, right? But we put different emphasis on it. Let's say that I tell you guys right now, you all have to donate $1,000. This is required for your program to donate $1,000 to some charity. Is somebody making $20,000 a year going to look at that different than somebody that makes a million dollars a year? I know I'm not gonna make you. Yeah, right? Their qualitative appearance of money is different. Genesis Foundation. Their qualitative appreciation of money is different. I always find it funny when people donation shame, right? They just did this with um, Jeff Bezos because Jeff Bezos donated $100,000 for COVID research. And I love the people that criticized him for this. Oh, that's just a dry, drop, drop in the dime for him. Shut up. It's $100,000 towards research. Just be quiet. You know, yeah, that may be a drop in the bucket to him, but that's not a drop in the bucket to people doing the research. That's a huge amount of research funding, right? 
if all of you got $100,000 tomorrow, would that change your life? For most of you, would that change most of your lives? Yeah, right? I think about this from a professional standpoint, like $100 my you're exactly right, Russell, right? I grew up poor all my life. That's why I'm a little bit of a money hoarder. You know, when I grew up, I'm not joking, we had bread sandwiches for dinner. I always loved that, bread sandwich. Um, I grew up really poor, so I tend to hoard my money a little bit. Don't freeze your foundation. I tend to hoard my money a little bit in preparation for events like this. But let's say now I'm as rich as Jeff Bezos. Wouldn't that be nice? Would that $100,000 mean as much to me? I probably to me, it would, right? But to the most people that are making that amount of money, the $100,000 doesn't mean anything to them. Right? They'll blow that on a car. They'll blow that on a spring house in you know, North Carolina or something weird like that. It must be nice. You're right, exactly, Russell. That's what I'm saying is we live in a quantitative world, but it also has qualitative cat or categories to it as well. You know, Qualitative study here. We have the first year of rehabilitation after stroke from two perspectives. They did a study on that looking at how it works, right? Category one. Our category here, we looked at the healthcare professionals and then regaining lost functions. And the patients, looking at it from their perspective, their ability to regain their formal social position and adopt to another social position. All of those are different ways we look at it, right? We may look at a study and it may be beneficial to society, it may be great, but it may not be beneficial to the person in the study, right? If we prove that, you know, we have an, it's a great ALS medication and we prove that the ALS medication doesn't work, that's great that we prove that ALS medication doesn't work. Does that help the people in the study? No. Right, so we have to be paying attention to that when we're looking at this, right? So here's kind of the, the what they call the pyramid of studies, right? We start all the way down at the bottom there with background information, right? So we start all the way down here. As we move further up this pyramid, the studies get better and the research is better, right? Single case studies, cohort studies, or studying more than one person, RCTs. Then we have article synapses, evidence synapses, and then our best is systematic reviews. So when you're looking at your boards, looks like a pyramid scheme too, it does, right? When you're looking at your boards, a lot of times they're gonna be asking you which of the following studies would be best to research X, Y, or Z, right? What you need to be going down there and looking for is systematic reviews. Right? Or it'll say something like a Cochrane systematic review. Those are what you need to pick there. If they're saying which one of these will be worse to prove something, most of the time it's going to be a case report or a case study. That's the two questions you'll get on your boards about this pyramid. There's not going to be something about what's the difference between a critically appraised individual articles versus a randomized control trial. It's going to be more looking at either end of that spectrum. So just be aware of that. So why do we do it? Well, we need to build our knowledge. We need to test the treatment efficiency, efficacy, improve patient care and impact health policy and enhance the understanding of daily practice. We did this when we wanted to change the Medicare cap. We had to show to Congress by doing back here and looking at systematic reviews that patients that get more physical therapy have a better quality of life. Now, when I say that, does that seem like common sense to you guys? What do you think? So I say, yeah, it does. It seems common sense to us, right? I mean, it's, it seems as common sensey as exercise gets you better. But, you know, Congress, we had to prove that to them. We had to prove that them getting more physical exercise and more therapy makes them better. To me, that's just silly, right? But we had to prove it. So that enhances our overall understanding of how we practice. You know, we have to look at research questions or theories, design study, collect data, analyze data, and draw conclusions. A lot of times, I'll be honest, where do you think we're going to fall prey to the most bias in this kind of scientific inquiry? Where, which part of this scientific inquiry are we going to run into our most bias? Yeah, right here. Right? In that analyze, an anal analysis of data. Because as much as we want to solve our problem, we also want to be proven right. 
Um, I've talked about this a couple times with those of you that have brought up restrictive blood flow, right? There are almost no studies that show restrictive blood flow doesn't work. That makes me really suspicious of BFR. If there are no studies that show that it doesn't work, that it doesn't work, that's a concern. That's cherry picking evidence, right? Uh, they just had a researcher I was watching last night on Sean Hannity that proved that he has 100% of his patients that took hydroxychloroquine got better. 100%. You think you'll ever have 100% research? No, you won't. Do you know why 100% of his patients got better? Because those that died, he discounted. He took them out of the study. If they died, it didn't count for his study. <laughs> Except jumping on a plane of country, right? Need him on the COVID task force. We do, right? And I find it funny that these same people that are saying this stuff, if we say, well, I want you to go treat at a hospital, none of them will do it. Just saying. Kenneth Copeland, I'm looking at you. So what type of data will get? Categorical, categorical data, right? Nominal data versus ordinal data, we've already talked about. Continuous data. Observations that can be counted and measured, right? Mixed data, mix of categorical and continuous. All of that comes into play, right? We need to collect data constantly. We need to be accepting that that data can change, right? How do we collect data? Observations. Observations are great, right? But reports and records are kind of higher up there on that chain, right? Same thing with interviews. Observations are great, but observations are our own perception of what we see. So we need that data as well. So those hard numbers and those records in order to prove our observations. And we need to consider the type of data collected, either categorical, continuous, or mixed. So variables, right? A variable comes in two different flavors, either the independent or the dependent variable. The independent variable is the examined order to determine its effect on the outcome of interest. It's often manipulated by the researcher. The dependent variable is the outcome of interest that's being observed, right? So when we look at research, right? So variables, what are we looking for? The effect of independent on dependent or dependent on independent? What do you think? What's the correct order over here? Okay. So I have one dependent on independent. Do I have any independent on dependent? Okay, we have one independent on dependent. So could we look at it either way? Let me ask you that. What do you think? Is there anyone asleep yet? Justin, are you awake? Just checking. We could look at it either way, couldn't we? Right? So the actual observations and measurements that you record, we want to look at the difference on the independent variable on the dependent, right? These are our observations. We need to look at how we do this. So we need to look at numbers for this. Means, right? The average. So if we, add, we average everything together here, we have a bunch of numbers. The average will be 4.89. The median is the midpoint of the data. Right, and the mode is the most commonly occurring. We talked about that in math and physics, if you remember. Percentiles, value between which certain percentage of the distributions will fall. Example, 75th percentile. So I'm gonna use myself as an example. Um, in competitive online destiny that I play right now, I fall in the ninth percentile. What does that mean? Yeah, right? Top 9% of all players. I fall, I fall in that top 9% of all players. It means that I'm good, right? So I'm above 91% of the population, exactly. So if I come to you and say, you know, your, your kid, I measure your kid and I go, your kid's doing great, right? They're in the 99th percentile. What do you think parents are thinking? Woohoo, 
in reality, what they're saying is, yeah, in reality, you're saying they suck. You're exactly right. Not my kid. So that's the kind of thing we have to understand. So just because the number is bigger doesn't always mean it's better, right? So when you fall in those percentiles, you're good. Call of Duty, I used to be, when back in the heyday of Call of Duty Black Ops, I used to be in the top 3%. Not so good anymore because I lost my hand. Ranked 21 in Black Ops, yep. So that's, that happens, right? You, we present, we, and, and honestly, a lot of people flout that, right? That's, that, that, that's some clout there. Quartiles, divides into four equal parts, right? And where you fall in those parts. Do we divide the abdomen to quartiles? Join my war zone. You'll kick my butt in war zone. I suck at that. I thought of doing a stream with you guys one day. It'd be kind of fun. Right? Quartiles, we divide everything in equal parts. We kind of have to understand that. The range is where we subtract the lowest from the highest. It does help a little bit. So like on a test, it'd be an honor to kill me. On a test, if I have a range of 55 points, what does that tell me about my test? Do you think I might have a problem with my test if I have a 55 point range? Either I've got a problem with my test or I've got somebody that really botched the test, right? I've got to look at that though. So we've got to divide it up into quartiles and see where those breakdowns happen, right? And then standard deviations, description of the spread of data, how much falls in a certain pre, uh, percentage, right? You guys have seen this, what is this called? It looks like a bell, right? It's a bell curve. Right? So you want your bell curve to be where you want it. Most of the times for my tests, I want my median, right, my, my bell curve median to be somewhere in the 80s. If my bell curve falls up in the 90s, I know I made my test too easy. Sometimes that's okay. Right? Sometimes I'll toss you guys a bone, right, because I want to give you a little bit of confidence. But most times my bell curve falls in the 80s. I'm going to have some people that fall into the C's, some people that fall into the A's, but the majority of you guys are going to be B's, and that's okay. And then some of you are going, no, that's not. Yes, it actually is. <laughs> it's okay for the average. It may not be okay for you guys, but it's okay for the average, right? We want those outer percentages to be less than 1%, but we want most of our people, and on average, you want about 65 to 70% of your people to fall in that middle category, right? So looking at this, this is kind of that standard bell curve, right? My standard deviation would be the difference between these two areas, right? So I should have different standard deviations as I move out, right? Standard deviation looks at how the changes occur. Go away, we'll draw. There we go. So, you do need to know these for your boards. I'm gonna tell you, you don't have to be able to de define them, but you need to know the difference between them. A comparison of two different groups is called a t-test. A comparison of three or more groups is an ANOVA. A comparison of two or more groups across two or more points is a factorial ANOVA. That's why I put these on one sheet for you. Association of two things is a correlation, but again, we remember, Correlation does not equal causation. Prediction of an event is called the regression. And then comparing different proportions is called a chi-square, a chi-square, whichever you want to call it, right? So hypothesis testing. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis that there is no significant difference between the specified population, any observed difference due to sampling or experimental error. So if I'm doing that one where we're talking about with COVID between aerobic exercise and percussive therapy, the null hypothesis would be that there's no difference between those, right? What's that little next letter that's coming up there? That looks weird. What is that? Yeah, it's the alpha value. Good, right? So the alpha value looks at, tells us how the uh, uh, extreme observed results must be in order to reject the null hypothesis. So this is showing our value of our study. Right? Typically 0.05% is, or 0.05 or 5% is what we're at. I mean, I think Chris said something about that before, right? The p-value is a probability that obtaining the test results will be as least extreme as possible. Okay. That was weird. I have no idea what that was. 
Um, probability difference between things being correctly or incorrectly declared as significant. So probability is going to tell us, you know, we have to state in our hypothesis what the probability of these things actually occurring are, right? So we have to be paying attention to all this. We need to know our null hypothesis. We need to know what our, our acceptable alpha value is going to be and what our acceptable p value is going to be. And most of the time they're going to state that in their initial abstract of what they found. So alpha value, level, and error. Type 1 error is where we observe a difference when there's not really a difference. Do you think we're at risk of doing that a lot? We think there's a difference and there's not. How about relationships? Right? How many of you guys have a type in your relationship? Anyone going to admit to that? No one's going to admit that they have a type? You're like, nope, apparently, right? But how many times when you get, <laughs> we both wear pants, okay. But how many times have you had an error in your type? This person's different than the last person. Yep, it is, okay, some of you are willing to admit that, good, right? You have made a type one alpha level error. So think about that next time that happens, or hopefully it doesn't happen to any of you anymore, but don't get mad at yourself. Just understand that in your research, you fell prone to a type one alpha error and your goal should be in the next time you do research to not fall for that type one alpha error, right? And then sometimes we fall prone to this in relationships as too, failing to observe a difference when there is one, right? Maybe treating the same person, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they'd have a clue. Uh, that'd be actually a good, you know, I made a type two alpha error and because I made a type two alpha error, you're a type one alpha error. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, that's a, that's a unique way of putting somebody down, I guess, right? So if we observe a distance when there isn't one, that's a type one. If we fail to observe, it's a type two. You do need to know those two different alpha types. Just be aware of that. That's why I put these on a the slide. You remember this one? Spin and snout? Do I have to beat this one or does this one you got in your heads a little bit? All right, good. We got that. For either test, we want values over 75%. So again, with the current COVID antibody test, with point set, you know, even 0 0.6, 0 .7, or 0.65, is that a good test? So if you have a specificity of 65 and a sensitivity of 65, no, it's not. It's no better than flipping a coin. I mean, it's a little better. Flipping a coin is 50%, right? But it's not any better than that, right? So here's two different tests, right? The horn blower sign is very specific and very sensitive. So what does that mean that it's very specific and very sensitive? It's very accurate, right? It's either going to rule in or rule out the condition, right? I don't believe that horn blowers have 100% sensitivity. Um, I'd be willing to bet they took a little bit of uh, statistical leeway with that where it's probably 99%. And they said, well, it's close enough to 100 that we'll call it 100. Um, but then we look at super spast and pinch, right? If we do the test and we get a negative, when we do the drop iron test, we want to do the, impine, uh, the supine impingement test because it's very sensitive. It'll help us rule in and out stuff. That's why there are usually multiple tests for everything we do in physical therapy, on top of the fact that it makes PT's job difficult. Intratester is two measurements, same person. Test retest is the stability of time over an instrument. And intertesters are two measurements, two different people. You guys have gone over that already with me. Oh, went too fast. Validity, theoretical soundness and definition. Face validity, does it test what it's supposed to? Content, does all domains within a construct are covered? And construct is the logical argumentation. Can it test back up a theory, right? So when I make a test for you guys, do I want it to fall in all three of those validity factors? Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a test ever in your life where you can clearly look at one of those validity factors and say that test didn't measure it? Yeah, right? Ideally, and don't get me wrong, instructors are still, and I'm just as guilty as anyone else, are definitely still, you know, fallible, right? And we still may not test everything to face content and construct. 
but somewhere in there, I should test all three of those factors. I should, right? If I'm teaching you a PEDS class, I should be testing you on PEDS, right? I should be able to logically argue that this test is testing you on PEDS, and it should contain all the content on PEDS that I need to cover. That's a good, valid test, right? So when we're looking at criteria related, we're comparing something to a gold standard or other established data, right? Concurrent validity compares test to a gold standard, right? Manual heart rate versus an EKG would be a great way of looking at concurrent validity. If the EKG, right? Or how about comparing your pulse rate with a pulse ox versus your measurement? Could that give you concurrent validity? Could, right? The pulse ox says you're at 86 and you're at 85 you know, you're pretty close, right? Predictive validity, how successful is predictive future? The SAT scores are a great example of it, right? The SAT scores used to predict college success. And I'm gonna say used to, because I'm not so sure how valid they are anymore, right? They seem to more try to give us a baseline of people more than predicting college success. All right, would you guys agree with me that SAT scores may not always suggest your college success? Some of you are very successful in college, and I bet if we looked at your SATs, you didn't do well. But if someone has a very, very high SAT score, there's a likelihood of them doing well in college. Prescriptive validity successfully prescribes treatments and should follow, right? So, you know, with total knee replacement, we have prescriptive validity on what kind of treatments work best for it. Reliability and validity. Can you have one without the other? Well, absolutely you can, right? But ideally we want both, right? So both of these here show accuracy, right? But let me ask you, your life's on the line. Which one of those shooters do you want protecting you? The right or the left? Yeah, the right. Yeah, right? You want the one that hits on target, right? Ironically enough, this one on the left is actually acceptable at most police departments. Because they're all in the same spot, exactly. So it's accurate, right? But it may not be the most accurate. It may not provide the most, right? The guy on the right is going to hit his target. The guy on the left is going to hit the people to the right of the target, but at least he's still going to hit the same people. So only one person is going to die that doesn't need to die. Just think of it that way. It's kind of scary when you think about it that way. Minimal detectable change, change beyond the threshold of measurement, either good or bad, right? And the clinically relevant, important difference, MCID. How clinically meaningful things are changed, right? If we have a range of motion, for example, on a shoulder, at some point, we have to be able to determine how much in that change of range of motion is actually beneficial to the patient, right? How many degrees would be a clinically relevant change? Do you anyone remember from, from range of motion? Yeah, five degrees. Because within five degrees, we may actually be errored, right? So we have to pay attention to that. Five degrees is an acceptable error va uh, variation. But five degrees is significant to the patient. Patient may think one degree is significant to them, but we know clinically relevant is about five degrees, right? They all want to know if I increase one degree. One degree doesn't help you, buddy, right? So that's when we're looking at statistically significant versus clinically meaningful. Statistically significant, one degree is statistically significant, but it may not be clinically relevant, right? If they gain one degree, great, they gain one degree, right? But it's not going to help them in picking their arm up, reaching above the shelf. So how do we know if the research is good? Well, the journal quality is big, right? Google best rehabilitation journals and see what you get. Then we're gonna look at the methodology and then we're gonna look at the charts and the tables. And we're gonna look at how good that research is. Where can research be found? Books, journals, internet database, right? Archives, interviews, observations, reports, records. Even Wikipedia can be useful in research. If you scroll past all the stuff at the top of the Wikipedia and go down to the sources. Right, those sources can be very useful in researching topics. But maybe not necessarily the same thing because anyone can edit Wikipedia. I've done it. 
We present research findings. We're going to look at tables, right? Rows and columns representing variables, pictures, pie charts, line charts. All this stuff works out well, again, because we are a visual species. It's funny, if you give two people two different forms of research, the one with the most pictures they consider is most effective, even though the other one may be more effective because we trend towards visual observations, right? The presentation research. Most research used to be presented in the APA format. Some of you guys hated APA format, but some of you didn't mind it. APA format is the most common format for research. The APA is starting to trend towards AMA format now because that's more relevant to medical research. The good news is once you get out of school, you're not gonna have to really worry about it because it's not like many of you are gonna do research. So thank gosh for that. So what are some constraints? This is kind of the end of the lecture here. What are some constraints to using the best EBP in clinic? What do you think? What might stop us from using the best EBP in clinic? Resources, right? Yeah, if laser is shown to be the most efficient at treating a supraspinatus tear, but we don't have a laser, it doesn't help us at all. Supervising PT can definitely be. Yep, the boss can be really big. What about where we are? Could that affect why we don't integrate that? So like again, Las Vegas, New Mexico versus Las Vegas, Nevada, could that affect integrating EBT or EBT? Sure could. Demographic can be big, right? So what do you think clinicians think of this idea of evidence-based practice? If you go out tomorrow and ask clinicians in the field, what do you guys think about this trend towards evidence-based practice? What kind, of, what kind of answers are you gonna get? Some of them may get, what? What's evidence-based practice? Because they've been so out of school so long they forgot about it. Right, do you think there's some people are gonna say it's hogwash? Yeah, right? It depends on how educated, right, the PT is. Some of them studied this EBP while they were in school and then just have given away because they know better, right? So why do you think there's this pushback in EBP? Well, it goes to everything, right? There's inherent bias in all of us, and we just tend towards things that are easy. This is one of the things I challenge you as a new clinician to do is always be looking at research. Take some time out of your week and better yourselves. Right? You guys, I, I, and I thank you guys for this. You guys force me to have to read research. And I really thank you guys for that. I don't like research, but you force me to read research, which changes my views on some things. You know, that some of my therapy, some of my treatment therapy, you know, I looked, I, I was a big proponent of constraint induced therapy. All the research is showing though now, it's not as effective as we once thought it was. So I've had to change my process. I've had to adapt to the research. Now, if I'm a bad clinician, I'm just going to say, oh, that's crap. I've used it and it works, so I'm just going to stick with what I do. So does the fact that a lot of people don't want to listen to the research kind of reflect the situation we're in right now? Yeah, right? Some of you guys, and I'm going to admit, probably even some of you guys that are out there right now, when I talk about the research on COVID, you're like, oh, that's not true. I'm not, no, none of you would admit it, right? Or when I go off on tangents about healthcare and stuff like that, some of you just tune me out. Justin. Um, but th this puts us where we're at today. Right? This is where we, we, are, we are becoming a society that doesn't want to do our own research. Right? We just want to be told, we want to watch a YouTube video that tells us how to do things. Right? This is big in my industry, in the gaming industry. Right? Because when I grew up, we didn't have YouTube. So how did you beat Super Mario Brothers? Yeah, practice and playing it. You sat and you played it, right? Nowadays, any video game I design, literally anything I put in a video game that I design, within an hour, I can pretty much guarantee there's going to be a YouTube video on how to beat it. It's kind of sad. <laughs> exactly, right? But before we wouldn't do that. Before we'd sit there or we'd just give up on the game, right? But in a way, Russell, you demonstrated a good thing because you went to the research, didn't you? You went to people that were subject matter experts in what you did 
in order to help you better yourself. So in a way it's bad, but in a way it's also good, right? Because it alleviated your anger and helped you get through it. But at the same time, you're demonstrating that you're using research. So that's, a, I, I would applaud you either way, but it's just amazing how much our information gets out nowadays, right? Just think about it. How quickly does it take for somebody to find out you're in a relationship nowadays? Doesn't take a lot of time, does it? Especially if you got the gram. Yeah, but before it used to be a lot different, right? Before it took a lot less time to figure out why you're in a relationship, who you're in a relationship with. <laughs> Facebook probably can, you're right. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, and like, would you like to end this relationship with? We, we say your relationship is up. Oh boy, that must mean all my relationships are going to end because I don't post anything anymore. Um, but yeah, so this research is big. We don't follow it as much as we used to. We don't respect science, right? I just, I, it, it's kind of sad. We just don't respect science as much as we used to respect science. And I don't know where we went wrong on this. I don't know when we started not paying attention to science. But science is now a bad word, I would say. If you look at the modern society, science just doesn't, I don't know, it, it's, it's not the same as it was or it used to be. We don't pay as much attention to science as we used to. But science doesn't care if you pay attention to us or you know, don't pay attention to us because I, 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 it just is science, science is facts. It's going to keep going whether we agree with it or not, right? It's just kind of the way we look at it. So we need to be paying attention to our science. So if we don't pay attention to science, the world can change without us and we can be left behind. And I would hasten to say that, you know, right now, the world is leaving us a little bit behind. Other countries have moved out of their pandemic and we're still stuck in it because we're not following science. That's beside the point. That's my personal hot take on that. Uh, I think that's the last slide. That is the last slide. So let me end my screen share. And we have Florida, exactly. All right. So that's it for this lecture. Is there any questions I can answer?